Thank you again. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, because you <coughs> you talked about actions and sensations and time. And a little bit later, you also talk about an interplay between uh, forward and backward uh, interactions. I wonder where do you think uh, prediction fits in this picture, or if it fits? Well, a uh, cursive loop inherently does prediction, right? Um, so, so prediction to me is is a is an essential part of, um, of of extracting this information, because I mean, uh, let me show you the picture, the slide again. Uh, rec uh, recursive estimation does exactly that, right? Um, it predicts the state into the future, and thereby and and then compares this prediction with what it's actually seeing. And this is also something that people have shown in humans, right? That that actually the sensory system predicts what the next sensor signal is and sort of measures, uh, perceives uh, the difference between the prediction and what's actually happening. So I, I think prediction is, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I think prediction is, um, is, absolutely, is absolutely essential. And one interesting part um, that, that relates to this, to this piece of work here um, is that showed you this graph, um, there's, there's this unsupervised mode of training this, which is actually kind of surprising, right? Um, so we're now training a neural network in an unsupervised fashion by using its own predictions about the future state and then using the error signal as the you know, discrepancy between its own prediction and, um, and, and, the, and the actual observation. So looking at this, usually what we do is we, we feed the error back from here, right? We have a prediction and we have a true state and that is the error. But we can also define the error here. And, and we have a new error and we can train the network. And as you saw um, in the dashed line, that actually works pretty well. So, so here is a, is a neural network that trains itself from data, right? Um, there's no, there's no supervision. There's nothing that's telling the robot, you're now in this state, and this is the error in your prediction. It's only looking at the world, and that's it. So, so yeah, that's a very cool, I think, side effect of, of having something encoded as a recurrent neural network, because you can feed an error at any po point uh, in that loop. So um, the question was about the architecture of neural networks. Uh, sort of arguing that there is a third component, right? There's data, there's algorithm, and then there's this um, this architecture of the neural network, the layers, how they're connected, and so on. You know, leave uh, out things and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that basically the uh, insight that in order to make neural networks work, you need to define an architecture, is is moving is moving towards this side. In a way, this architecture represents some fuzzy form of algorithm, right? I mean, it's not an algorithm, but but if you if you think about this being a continuum, then imposing an architecture already is more specific than not. Uh, you know, you can you can refine this even further as we did, and, and imposing an algorithm, a specific algorithm inside that architecture. So, so what we've done is nothing else but define an architecture. So, so I think yes, you're right. Defining an architecture is one way of moving along this spectrum. Does that make sense? Um, so I liked uh, the example of the hand that you gave, um, and saying that compliance plays a very important role there, right? And um, uh, when thinking about compliance and then going back to more the the, uh, the new network uh, examples that you gave, um, I'm wondering if uh, the compliance is really more about you know something like an algorithm, or if it's maybe uh, more about the representation, um, because you could also say that maybe uh, if you find you know if, if you say representation is what a uh, hidden layer of a new network um, encodes, right? So in, in the literature, we have uh, uh, layers encoding faces, right, in, in, in some way. So maybe, uh, could you also say that uh, if you find a very compliant representation 
in the neural network, if this also helps a lot. And uh, how much of the, the task of, of you know, solving these problems is about integrating algorithms versus maybe shaping the representations using our intuitions? Yeah, so I, I very much agree with you on the importance of representations, and that was one of the tools that I mentioned all the way in the beginning. And, and uh, Rico actually has also done some work on, uh, on representation learning. I think that's, that's you know, a very important way of us uh, being able to, to move along the spectrum. Um, now, you, you mentioned compliant representations at intermediate layers in a neural network. What exactly do you mean by compliant? Sorry, uh, can you... Can, um. No, uh, taking your example of variability again, I mean, if, uh, if the representation is able to nicely uh, ignore lots of variability, I mean, this is also something you could, you could argue is, is being done in the neural network if you have the, fi uh, the, the right intermediate representation, right? Yeah, yeah so that's, uh, that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. Um, so a compliant representation is something that in itself ignores variability. I guess that's just called a representation, right? Because a representation is sort of, is, is by definition the things that you need to solve the problem. So, so in a way, I guess a representation already does that. But the thing, that, uh, wh wh why I'm hesitating is because to me uh, there are two very separate things. The compliance and the physical hand um, deals with uh, a property of physical contact, right? So if you pick up something, um, whether you have success or not depends on very minute things, right? If you just open your hand just a little bit, the thing drops. So, so you have um, sort of almost a discontinuous function uh, that you need to control. Whereas um, in neural networks, you basically assume that there's some continuity, otherwise you don't really have a gradient. So, so I think that um, that they actually address sort of complementary issues. In the physical world, we have these nasty problems that depend on contact and that, you know, where, where if, if I hold something and then I move one finger, all the other fingers somehow have to compensate, right? So, so there's interaction between these things um, and b in, in a discrete way. So it's a very difficult optimization problem uh, if you allow uncertainty. Um, and so I think that compliance is the right way of addressing that particular problem. Um, but in general, I mean, wh what, what you're saying is true. What happens because of that compliance is that it ignores irrelevant variability and focuses on the, of the relevant one. So th there's also an analogy. So yeah, very good. Thanks. So you talked a lot about um, yeah, t to reduce the redundant data um, and get the, the good one left. And for this, you need some kind of a bias. Uh, how do you come up with these biases? Uh, do you need someone to handcraft them, or perhaps handcraft at a more meta level of bias, or yeah? Yeah, I think all of the above, right? Um, so, so I'm not very choosy. Uh, I want to make robots that do interesting things. I want to understand how we can build robots that do interesting things. So if I have to design 500 biases, and then I can do it, I'm fine with that. But I don't think, as always in science, having a single approach to a problem is the right thing to do. So, so I think we need to design things by hand. And we've, we're, we're doing that in this perception problem, right? Each of these recursive estimation loops was designed by hand, was fed with uh, some prior that we thought was useful. Um, so, so that was entirely hand designed. Um, then in our work on representation learning, we're basically uh, letting that bias be learn from data um, and and so the the idea of, of you know how can we then sidestep uh, because because that basically is the whole problem right how can we sidestep that problem well we introduce another bias well how does how do we get that bias you know is it again engineered yes in our case it was engineered but it was a very general bias so we, we, we tried to do a, a mapping of, of a camera image to a state right so basically a robot moving in a room and from the camera image, it was supposed to give you x, y, theta. And um, so, so that was, was a difficult learning problem, just from the raw camera image. But we provided it with um, a, a very simple bias, which is Newton's laws of motion. Now, you can call that engineered, 
that's fine with me, right? But it's a very general bias. And using that very general bias that we know should work or should hold for pretty much anything in robotics, uh, it, it can learn this. So sometimes um, a small bias is sufficient to get bootstrapped. Now, beyond that basic layer of, well, let me take a step back. So, so let's look at how evolution did it. Right, because obviously evolution found the right biases for us. And we do have biases in perception, in, in everything. Right? Every optical illusion illustrates that we have some kind of bias. So how did evolution do it? There's a clear sort of, um, you know, a search. It's not quite random, but it's, it's a pretty unguided search of over algae and little bugs that crawl around and, and sort of building up incrementally from that, right? And as Rod Brooks would point out, we've, we've um, taken billions of years to develop the cell, but once we had the cell, everything else was pretty easy in, you know, evolutionary time scale. So, so I think our strategy must be the same. We need to get the right starting level, right? We need to get the right starting equipment. We need to do this part that evolution did, um, but then from then on, you know, we, we, we're equipped with lots of stuff from evolution, but we can learn amazing things, right? I mean, we're genetically identical to our ancestors 30, 40,000 years ago, but they didn't build airplanes. So somehow, once we have the right basic equipment, things can go pretty quickly. So, so that's sort of the hope, to, to find this sweet spot where, or I guess the tipping point, if you want to uh, use buzzwords, um, where, where all of a sudden things start to happen. And until we find that point, I'm fine with everything. Learning it, designing it, uh, copying it from biology. I think these are our three only options. And I'm saying, let's use all three of them as much as we can. So, uh, so I really like the idea of uh, combining these algorithms that work really well on computers with uh, learning techniques that can actually model things that are incredibly difficult to model ha by hand. Um, and I think it's also important to remember that computers don't think like humans, so we don't necessarily have to code it that way, but there's something sort of really uh, very sexy about the idea that we can have these neural networks that can possibly atomically model all of these different phenomenon and then kind of stack them all together kind of like what you presented but in sort of an automated way i mean that sort of be like the grail if a computer could kind of like we do just learn flight dynamics from observing a bottle fly through the air or something like that but um i was just sort of wondering do you think that fits into what kind of work you're working on is that sort of in a, the wrong direction from what you think where we should go or uh, how does it all fit together so if i understood correctly you're you're saying there's something appealing about uh, sort of uh, learning from scratch using neural networks. Is that today? Yeah, yes, but learning atomic models for things like uh, the model for a prismatic joint is not the same thing we probably would use to describe invariants and in images, for instance. And so I was wondering if there is, if taking the same approach of decomposing all of these yeah. different steps can be automated. So, so I think decomposition uh, clearly is a very important concept. Uh, has been in engineering for a very long time. There are people that claim that, for example, our brain, even though it is modular, is not sort of decomposed in that sense. So what does decomposition mean? It means that you were able to, to, to um, put most of the complexity into something that is sort of independent and that communicates with other things on a low bandwidth, you know, very narrow channel. And it's unclear whether actually that is sufficient. And neural networks would probably even be an argument against that, right? That, that things need to be much more connected. And that modularity in the strict sense is, is worked well for us for engineering for a long time, but, but, uh, and will continue to work, of course, but, but may not be able to solve that problem. So uh, the question is, so, so, so decomposition, irrespective of how you do it with algorithms, or you do it um, with neural networks is a tough problem. Because by decomposing something the wrong way, for example, by 50 years ago, people saying we have computer vision and we have robotics separately, that was a big mistake, I think, because those things belong together. 
So we, we prevented ourselves from making progress. I mean, we made other progress, but from making progress into that combined direction for 50 years because we had the wrong decomposition. So, so the composition, irrespective of neural networks and other methods, is, is a big problem. Now, um, to me, I, I really am agnostic to method. I like neural networks, I like algorithms, and I like everything in the middle. So, so when do I think an algorithm, uh, when do I think an algorithm is appropriate, and when do I think a neural network is appropriate? If I don't have a good language bias or hypothesis space or a learning algorithm, then I use something that has a very wide open uh, hypothesis space, like neural network. And maybe, so, so, so if I know a lot about the problem, you know, like quick sort, I can just write an algorithm. I mean, I can probably also make a neural network that sorts numbers, but why, why would I? Uh, you know, I, I think there's very little motivation to do that if you have quicksort. Now, I if I'm trying to solve a problem where I have no idea how it works, well, you know, it makes perfect sense to start over here. But now that you have actually come up with a neural network that solves that problem somewhat, aren't you curious what that neural network does? Right? I mean, wouldn't it be cool to figure out, you know, what, what algorithmic idea was I missing that I couldn't program that? And so, so you can imagine some even automated way of starting with a neural network, extracting some language prior from that neural network, switching to some other method with a stronger language prior with the one that you actually specified, and moving incrementally over until you found something that has such a strong language prior that you would call it a programming language. Right? I mean, C++ is a language. It has a language. You, you can only make C++ expressions, right? So, so uh, neural networks are much more general, but it's a continuum, right? We can imagine things in the in the middle, and so I think the the I don't know if that's uh, really answering your question, but I think the right way is if we don't know something, let's start here and move over here, right? Let's extract the the biases that we need from the solutions that we found, and let's bootstrap our knowledge of the problem until we've found the right problem. So for example, recursive estimation. Let's say nobody had invented base filter yet. We make a neural network and it's, it, it, it solves state estimation. Well, there's a base filter in there. Can we get it out and can we describe it? Because now we can do all kinds of things. We can implement it on very small chips. We can adapt it for this. We, can add, we, we, we now have the, the arsenal of engineering in our hands to make stuff cooler. So, so I think it's great to use all tools when they are the appropriate tool to use. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, one of the things that uh, you said at the beginning is that you just defined four priors, and one of the priors was data selection. And you said, well, robot just has the data that it faced. But, and then from there, you build all this system. But one of the problems that um, robots face in a real environment, in a real life environment, open ended environment, of course, is variability. But another one is the lack of data. Sometimes data is incomplete. Because here, it looks like data is perfectly there. That is, for me, is one of the main constraints in machine learning is I provide you the perfect data that you need, and then you learn. But usually a robot is not going to do that in a real environment. It's going to get some data, and from there it has to learn, and it's going to find new data, and then it's going to learn. So how do you, would you think that this would fit in your method? So, so two things. I mean, thank you. you. You're pointing to active learning, which I think is absolutely central and important, and I didn't mean to sideline that in any way. I think it's absolutely, it, it, it's, it's, it's part of our tools mm -hmm. that we need. Um, and, and that's one way of, of reducing the amount of data that we need. But, but it still requires us to be able to pick the data. And, and the robot may not be able to pick data, it just has to wait on data to come, right? On experience mm -hmm. to happen. The only thing I know to hope for, uh, to reduce data, is to have the right prior. Mm -hmm. Right? If, if I give you two points, and I say, fit a curve to this, you have nothing. If I give you two points and I say it's a line, then you're done, right? So if, 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 if we want to reduce our data hungriness, we need to compensate the lack of data with a prior. Mm -hmm. And if we have the right prior, then very little data can give us a lot of information. 
right? It's, 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 it's a simple dimensionality game, right? We have to pick from a very high dimensional hypothesis space, but if we can somehow reduce that to a lower dimensional manifold through some prior, mm -hmm. then a few data points may be sufficient. So, so I think still that problem points back to priors. Mm -hmm. right. it's, it's the only thing that we have. Right? And I mentioned that, that humans have 300 million input dimensions. We have about 600 to 800 muscles. Um, so that's our output. And that's it, right? I mean, we have sweat glands, but with, we don't use those voluntarily. Um, so so it's, a, it's a 300 million to 800 uh, problem. I mean, the mathematical space is so huge that I don't think, you know, you can, there's formula that can tell you how much data you need to define a manifold in, uh, in such high dimensional space. It's, it's more than there's atoms in the universe. So the only way, the only hope that we have is to use priors. Okay, thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and see you at the next uh, A-talk session. Thanks. Good evening. <laughs>